Yeah. All right. Well, hello. How was lunch? Good. All right. Uh, my name is Tom Friedhoff. I'm one of the developers over at Active Lamp. Today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about revision control for managing your code. Um, just to outline what we'll be going over, we'll uh, talk about some revision control concepts. We'll look at CVS, SVN, and Git. Uh, we'll look at how to install Drupal from uh, the Drupal repository, CVS repository, um, using CVS commands, and then we'll show how to do it a little bit easier using Drush. Um, it's going to be a pretty high-level overview of Drush. We're not going to go into detail because you know that could that's basically another presentation or could take up a whole other presentation. Um, after that, we'll look at the Drupal release system, branches and tags, and then uh, we'll look at installing updates, creating patches and applying patches. And we're talking about patches because that's basically you know what version control is, is passing around patches and man managing patches. Um, so we'll look at uh, how to do that and what a patch actually is. And then uh, we'll look at managing your development environment and your custom changes um, that are outside of Drupal. How many people are new to revision control or have never used revision control? OK, cool. So basically, what revision control is, it's a, it's a software system that tracks uh, your changes that you make to code. One second, let me turn off this Twitter. OK, if I put this on mute, is that OK? OK. Um, it's a software system that tracks your code. And what it's, what it's good for is if you've got uh, you know, multiple developers that are working on your team, say you're working on, uh, you've got two developers working on the same module, how do you manage um, being able to merge those changes if they're working on the same code? Well, that's where revision control comes into play. Basically, revision control tracks each line of code in, say, the module that you're working on. So if you've got two developers working on the same module, they could be working in different lines of the, uh, of the module. And when they commit this back to the software system, this version control system, the version control system will basically figure out what goes where. So you're not going to clobber each other's data. So if you're familiar with uh, FTP, uh, which most everybody should be, um, working with multiple developers with FTP is not a good idea. You know, if developer one is working on, say, X module, and developer two is working on that same module, um, and developer one FTPs their information up to the development server, and developer two then does it afterwards, then you just pretty much clobber developer one's changes. Well, that's where revision control comes into play. Uh, you commit it to this software system, uh, version control system, and it will manage the changes for you. So basically allows for collab collaborative editing of data. The first uh, version control system that we're going to talk about is CVS. Uh, CVS has been around for a while, and it's actually the version control system that the Drupal project uses. Uh, it's been around since 1986, so um, yeah, it's just it's been around for a while. There's, there are other systems that have come out to uh, kind of come up or fix some of the limitations that come with CVS. And let's look at those limitations. Basically, some of the limitations that you get with CVS, uh, this version control system, if you're familiar with the system, um, it's really hard to do things in CVS. For instance, one of the things, moving files in CVS. You know, basically, when you're working with a version control system, you have to register files with the software system so you can basically track the changes. And doing things like moving files in CVS is a pain in the butt. Uh, anybody have any experience doing that? Yeah. It's, you... To get around moving files in CVS, you basically have to either, you know, delete the file and re-add it, or you know you have to do some crazy things with the file system to get all that uh, versioning information with it. One of the other limitations with CVS is uh, atomic commits, and what that means is, you know, if your commit fails in the process of pushing that up to the server, um, you know, you pretty much screwed up your version control system because it doesn't roll back to how it was before. Um, the commit started. And when we look at a, we'll, we'll get into how, you know, this version control actually works with some diagrams. But basically, your CVS server that's, that's managing this code is on the internet. If you're committing information or uploading this information to that repository and your internet connection goes down, um, well, you've got a half committed, <laughs> you've got half committed files basically up on the file server. Another limitation with CVS is, uh, you know, it treats every file as text. So, you know, how many people build websites with images? 
Yeah, pretty much everybody <laughs> nowadays. So if you're going to be managing your website with CVS, uh, you basically got to throw in an extra flag here, uh, a binary flag saying that this is an image. And this is kind of a pain in the butt because then you've got to go to your images directory and say these are binary images. And CVS is not a distributed system. So what came after CVS was a system called Subversion. And Subversion, you know, was basically, it was designed to replace CVS. And it, it overcame many of the limitations, but it didn't overcome all of them. Um, one of them is it's still not a distributed system. And, you know, there's still little things that you have to do to kind of manage your code. You still have to tell uh, Subversion that you're moving files or deleting files or um, whatever you're doing with the files. Um, it's a little bit easier in Subversion. All you have to do is type this command SVN move and you don't have to, you know, go jump through all those hoops that you do with CVS. So, but this will essentially get your file to move um, and, and carry along the version data. Now, that's a little bit different in Git. Uh, anybody familiar with the Git system? Okay, great. Yeah, with Git, what's nice about Git is you don't have to worry about moving files or deleting files. It's just, you know, Git manages the whole, the whole folder. So you can move a file and Git will pick it up uh, the next time you come around to it. So, uh, yeah, Git's got some really cool features that aren't in SVN and CVS, but uh, it's also a little bit more complex because it's got that. Git is a distributed uh, version control system. And we'll get into what uh, that means here in a couple slides. But, uh, you know, it's not as easy to grasp as CVS and SVN for the main reason that it's got more, more to it, you know. And basically the architecture, and you'll see in the diagrams, is a little bit more complex as well. So it works great for, you know, distributed teams that want uh, version control on their own local machine. Um, but it's, a, you know, a little bit higher barrier to entry trying to get into it. All right, so I've been talking about these two types of version control systems. You've got centralized version control and you've got decentralized version control. So CVS and SVN is what's called uh, centralized version control. You basically have a version control uh, system out here, out here on the cloud. Excuse me, sorry. And basically the way this works is you know, your version control system is out here on the cloud on, installed on some server. You know, it could be your server uh, out on the internet. You can, you can get it through a hosted service like on Fuddle or uh, Spring Loops or one of the other systems. But it's basically a repository that's out there on the internet that your developers connect to. And the way this works is when your developers come in on a project, they basically pull the latest code from the central repository over the internet. And as they make changes uh, to that code that they've pulled, pulled down from the repository, they're able to commit those back to the central repository with all the version data that comes with it. And of the other developers on the team are able to pull this as well. Now, what's actually happening, so if you're familiar with FTP, you know, if you uh, were doing this in FTP, you know, you would download a file and then make your changes and upload the file. Well, version control actually works a little bit different than that. You're basically, when you're working with version control, downloading the file and then any changes that you make here on your local machine, you're basically uploading a patch to the version control system that's just uploading the changes there. You know, so if developer one is working on a file, he commits it to the version control system, it's gonna upload the changes from the initial file. Developer two is working on a file, it's gonna upload his changes from the initial file. So if these developers pull updates, it's just gonna pull the changes from the version control system that the other developers have worked on. And you're not gonna be clobbering each other's data because it's, you know, again, just the changes there. Well, the decentralized version control system, you know, it's kind of got the same architecture. You know, you've still got this repository out here on the cloud. Uh, we call this the tracking repository. But down here, you see each developer has a local repository on their, on their local machine. And, you know, this is great for a couple of reasons. You know, first off, your repository is local and nobody else sees this repository for, except for you. So that'll allow you to be able to commit changes more often because as you're working through your code, you know, you may want to have a version of this later on down the road, but you don't want to push it to the rest of your team. So what's nice about having a local repository is you can keep these different versions to yourself until you're ready to push this out to the cloud where the rest of your team can get it. Uh, so once, so it's, once you're happy with what you've got, 
uh, with a distributed system, you can then push this out to the tracking repository and then your other developers that are working with you can then see that there's something that they need to pull uh, from the tracking repository and uh, you know, basically patch their local install or their local uh, development environment with those patches. One other nice feature of uh, a distributed version control system is, you know, we have this tracking repository that's out here where we can push these changes out there, but with Git uh, and distributed version control in general, you don't have to necessarily use this tracking repository. You can push your changes from your local repository to other developers that are working on your team. So for example, if this were a larger team, say these three developers here were one department of a larger company and they're working on a specific feature um, of, the, of the project, you know, they can collaborate together and push their changes between each other without going to the tracking repository. When this team is happy, uh, you know, as, as the three developers, they can push this out to the tracking repository and then basically the other developers on the team can then pull those changes. So it's pretty nice. Um, Basically, with Git, you would just say git push, and you can define the address of this, uh, or basically put in the address of that developer, and this developer would push his changes to that developer over here. So we're not even playing with that there. All right, so to summarize uh, the advantages, you know, you have a repository without a network connection. And, you know, how many people are going to Paris for DrupalCon? All right, well, if anybody were going to Paris for DrupalCon, I don't know, it's at a 14 hour flight. You know, what's nice about a dis distributed system is if you plan on working on the plane, you have a version control system local on your computer that you can commit to. You don't have to wait 12 hours to do a whole bunch of work on five different modules and then land in Paris and do one huge commit of like the five things that you fixed. You know, you can have a version control system like Git on your, your local machine and commit those changes as you fix uh, the issues. And like I said, with version control, each commit is actually a patch. So you don't want to have, you don't want to fix 12 different things in one patch that you're sending back up to the server. Uh, you want to kind of separate those out so you can go back to a specific point and say, oh, I fixed this bug with the, this widget. Uh, or whatnot. So, yeah, it's a good idea to separate your commits and treat them like patches so you can go back in time and do that. With a system like Git or a decentralized version control system, you have that. You know, it's local, so it's really fast. Um, if you're familiar with committing out to SVN or CVS on a central server, you know, it may take five seconds, ten seconds, depending on the size of the commit, to get all those changes uploaded to the central repository. Well, with Git, you get that in a matter of a second. You know, everything's local, so you get a really fast version control system. You know, sometimes me personally, I confess, um, if I've got a large commit, you know, I'll just, I'll just hold off on it even though I think I, I should because I don't want to wait, you know, 30 seconds for the commit to, to get up there. Um, with, with a distributed system like this and having a repository local, you know, you can just make the commit locally and it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's not trivial. So, uh, also sharing with selected people is easy. As you saw, we don't have to push it out to the cloud. We can share with our team. And because you have a local repository, you know, you can create branches in your own repository and experiment without pushing it to the rest of the team. So if you're working on some feature that you don't want the rest of the team to see because it's just, you know, an idea that you want to hash out, you know, create a branch in your local repository. Uh, if it works out, merge it back into your, your main repository and push it out to the cloud so the rest of the team can see it. So having a local repository does promote experimentation. All right, so what's all this have to do with Drupal? Well, we're getting there. Uh, first, I want to go over some simple commands that you'll see in most version control systems. All right, so to, to work with version control, uh, the first thing that you have to do is actually to get your version control system um, to know about the files that you want to use. So for example, with CVS and SVN, they, they both have an import command. So if you've got, you know, just downloaded your, your version of Drupal and you want to get this into your own version control system, you would import that into your SVN repository and uh, basically that, those files would basically be set up so you can start uh, working on different versions. Once your files are in the repository, you're going to have to check those files back out and now begin working on the files that you've checked out 
uh, that's going to be the version. Um, that'll be the version files that you'll be working on. Uh, you don't want to work on the initial files because that doesn't have all the extra information that uh, a subversion checkout gives you. As you're working on your files, there's a add command, you know, so CVS add or SVN add or, or git add. You need to let your version control system know about files that you want it to track. Uh, so you would just call the add command to get that file into the system. As you're making changes with a file, you would call a commit. And with a commit, you're basically uploading those changes to your repository. With that commit, you're also putting a message in there saying uh, why you changed it or what the change was so other developers that are working with you uh, can see what the upload is doing. Once the code is committed to the repository, you would call an update, or the other developers that are, are working with you would call an update so they can get all the latest changes from the repository. Basically, it's going to download all those patches from the repository, install those patches on their local machine, and now they've got the latest code from the repository. And then there's the delete command. And like I said, you don't need to use this in Git, but with CVS and SVN, you can uh, yeah, just delete your file, and then the repository will stop tracking um, those files. Are there any questions so far about this? Okay. Yeah, does it have any, uh Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're going to go into how to actually maintain that uh, using the CVS system that Drupal offers you, because that's real simple to do your updates uh, if you're using if you're checking Drupal out from CVS, and that's actually the uh, the part that we're going to get into next. Any other questions regarding uh, version control in general? Yeah, good. A lot of times in, uh, in Drupal, most of the configurations are done through the database. And as far as keeping versioning in the database configurations, when you're talking about adding certain patches, that just doesn't work out. Do you know of any kind of yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty hot topic on how to uh, deal with that. And that's an issue that we deal with at Active Lamp. Uh, you know, all the configurations are in the database. How do you keep that version? And that's really a topic more for deployment uh, and how that works. And in the next hour, uh, Chris Stefano, myself, and I believe Scott Nelson will be doing a panel on deployment. And yeah, we can address that question in there. That's a, that's a whole animal right there. And there's different techniques uh, to be able to manage that. What, with the database, yeah, because the database, uh, I mean, there, there are tools out there uh, that I've seen on Drupal.org that I haven't used that can merge uh, your database, but, uh, you know, we have a technique at Active Lamp that we use to be able to deal with that, um, and, yeah, that's a hot topic. All right, so let's get into uh, Drupal. So how do, you, how do ninjas install Drupal? So well, basically, if you type in this command, um, you're going to be doing a CVS checkout of Drupal there. We've got some parameters saying where we're going to get this checkout from, you know, the anonymous user at the cvs.drupal.org uh, server in this repository. But you first off do a CVS checkout. So if you guys remember from my commands, we're going to pull out versioned uh, information from Drupal. What that command would do is get us the head version of Drupal. Does anybody know what head is in version control? Okay. Right. So, yeah, a ninja wouldn't do that because head is not stable. That's the latest version of Drupal at that point in time. This is a diagram of what uh, a version control system looks like. You can see up here, you can consider this a timeline uh, of, of code. Uh, for Drupal. You know, you have, you have one timeline that keeps moving forward. This is head. And then at s certain points in the timeline, uh, Dries or whoever the core maintainer is for that release will say, okay, you know what? Drupal 6 is ready. Let's release Drupal 6. And at that point in time, a branch is going to be made for Drupal 6. So what happens is this branch gets split off from the timeline, and now we have two different timelines that are running. At this point in time, this is now Drupal 7, right? So 
we've got two timelines going on. Drupal 6 is, is uh, further developing. You know, we've got uh, the different versions. You know, this may be February of this year. This may be July right here. But at this point right here, we have what's called a tag. And we can see this is a Drupal 6-13. What this is, a tag is a snapshot of that of Drupal at that point in time. So basically, when you go to download Drupal 6.13, what, what you're doing is you're downloading Drupal at that point in time that they said, hey, this is Drupal 6.13. Does, does that make sense to you guys how this is a timeline? OK, great. So basically, yeah. If you download the head version of Drupal, you're getting Drupal 7, and you may be getting something that hasn't been tested, and uh, it may be broken. So yeah, make sure you specify the tag in there. And this is basically how the Drupal release system works. So you know, back here you can see, way back a couple years ago, we got Drupal 5, and Drupal 5's got its own branch. Drupal 6, back here, has got its own branch. And then in uh, you know, sometime, first quarter of next year, we're gonna see another branch come out here of Drupal 7. And once that branch for Drupal 7 comes out, you know, now that's Drupal 8 up there. All right, so let's, let's look at how real ninjas install Drupal. So here's that same command that we saw. Uh, we've got a couple extra parameters in here, just so we're put, adding some compression in here. Uh, so um, not so much data is traveling across the wire. And then, you know, this, we're, I've abbreviated checkout, you know, so you can abbreviate with a CO. Uh, I've added a dash D for a local directory. And then here's the dash R. Here's the revision of Drupal. So that's saying, okay, give me Drupal at that specific point in time where the core maintainer said, okay, this is stable. This is Drupal 6, 13. Um, and yeah, that'll give you Drupal. If you want more information on that, uh, go to drupal.org node slash 320. This is just an install. That's why you use anonymous passwords. You're not ever going to check that back in, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, you're never going to check this back in. There's only two people that have access uh, to commit uh, back to the Drupal repository. Uh, so, yeah, you're going as anonymous, and you only have read access, basically, to that. All right, so that's a lot to type. <laughs> it's a lot to remember as well. That's where Drush comes in. Drush is the Drupal shell. So if you remember that two line, uh, the, those two lines that you had to type in, you know, you could basically do all of that with Drush DL Drupal. Um, and you may be asking yourself, well, what version of Drupal am I getting? Drush actually handles that for you behind the scenes. What Drush is doing is it's going to go see what the latest tag of Drupal is, and it's going to download that version of Drupal. Now, anybody in here not know what Drush is? Okay. So there's a module. It's not really a module, but you can find it on the modules page, I believe, of Drupal.org called Drush. And Drush is a Drupal shell. It gives you a lot of commands uh, so that you can interact with Drupal from the command line uh, without having to point and click through, you know, basically a web interface. Um, there's a lot to Drush, and I, I believe there are some presentations here uh, at this camp that are going to talk about Drush. Uh, so definitely, you know, check it out. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a power user tool. So you can, to do different things. So basically with Drush, you can do a CVS checkout just by doing this. Um, when you download Drush, it doesn't actually, by default, check out from CVS. Drush will actually uh, pull the zip file that you get from drupal.org. Uh, when you're downloading. So you, you have to configure Drush to say, you know what, no, I want this to come from CVS because I want all the version information that comes with it. And with that version information, it, it makes it a lot easier for us to say, update, uh, upgrade modules when a new module upgrade comes out. So the way you do this is there's a, there's a configuration file for Drush. It's called the drushrc.php configuration file. And you'd basically just add this option in there saying the package handler, I want it to be CVS. And that'll, that'll get you a checkout from CVS. All right, so let's add some modules to the mix. Uh, before we do that, I just want to mention that there's actually two CVS repositories on Drupal.org. Uh, you got, oops. There we go. 
you've got uh, the core repository and then the contributions repository. Uh, basically, you need, uh, you're going to be pulling all your contributed modules out of the contributions repository. Uh, so you've got to keep that in mind when you're typing your CVS command. All right. So to download CCK, uh, well, that's, that's even a longer string than working with core. You, you see we've got the same parameters up here. This is all the same information. Um, now we're pulling out from the Drupal Contrib repository. We're downloading it to the sites all modules CCK directory. We're specifying the revision. And then we need to know where in the repository CCK is. And once you get familiar with the repository, you know that all the modules are in contributions, modules, and then whatever the directory is. But you may be asking yourself, how do you find this version number? You know, how do you know what CVS tag you can pull uh, out of the repository? Well, one way you can do this is to actually go to cvs.drupal.org in your web browser. And this is a web interface to the Drupal repository. You would just navigate to the contributions modules CCK directory. And on that page, you'll see a drop down here. And in that drop down, you'll see all the branches and all the tags. Now again, tags are what's deemed stable. That's, that's the snapshot in time that the um, module maintainer said, hey, this is stable. So we can see here that we have a tag of Drupal 6, 2-5. So from that uh, CVS command that you saw earlier, that, that would be the tag that you would have to type in uh, to that CVS command. Now, that, that's quite a bit of work. You know, just to download a module, you need to go to the website and see which version tag you download. Well, Drush can do all that for you. So this is how real ninjas install modules effectively. Drush, download, CCK. And what that's going to do is that's going to look up the latest tag for CCK. It's going to download that from CVS, and it's going to put it in your site's all modules folder for you. Is that a time saver? Any questions so far regarding that? Go. Is it going to pull it from CVS if you change your, uh, your options to uh, tell it to come from CVS, or is that just a natural uh, way of handling Yeah, so in the drushrc.php file, uh, you do have to change the package handler uh, in there. And when you download Drush, you saw that snippet that I had for the drushrc.php. That, you know, all those options are in there, and they're just commented out. You just need to go in there, find that, uh, that option, and uncomment it. And it will download from CVS. So by default, Drush does not download from CVS. It downloads the zip file. You need to set it up to download from CVS. What about development versions and stable versions or whatever? Yeah, so if, sometimes you, know, you don't want, the question was, what about development versions and stable versions? Sometimes you don't want uh, the latest stable version. You want the latest development version. Well, Drush will download the latest stable version for you. The way I get around that is, you know, it's, it, this is another advantage to deploying from CVS is once it's down from CVS, then you can go into that directory yourself and say, okay, I want the latest version of this. Go, take me to the top of the branch. I don't want the tag. I want the top of the branch so I can get the latest uh, stuff for this module. Now, that may not, that's not going to be the most stable version. You know, the module maintainer didn't tag that as, hey, this is a stable version. So you're, you're basically, you need to know what you're doing if you're going to get the latest uh, code from the repository. Any other questions? Sure. Is, is there a way in like, the threshold I'm downloading to get like, if I want six or seven? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me go back. <laughs> that, that's, a really, that's a really good question. She asks, is there a way to get six or seven modules with Drush? Um, and the answer is yes. Basically, if you wanted to get CCK, views, admin menu, feed API, um, node queue, you know, all the, all the modules that you have typically with every Drupal site, you can type in Drush DL and then every single module name right after it, and it'll go grab 15 modules, 20 modules, all for you, and you just did it right there from the command line. And that's, I mean, that's the beauty of Drush right there. If you did that the, the standard way, you'd have to go to, what, 15 different project pages, click on the tarball for the uh, zip file, extract it, put it into your site. And, you know, that's a, that's a lot of steps. Well, with Drush, you can basically do that with one command, and it'll just pull it all out of C, uh, CBS. Excuse me? 
Uh, Drush DL. Yeah, so just Drush DL and then all your module names, just separated by space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can do the same thing uh, with that. So, actually, with Drush, you know, I believe you can you can specify a version with Drush. You know, the way I normally handle that is I just download uh, the latest version of Drupal, and then I'll just change directory into that and call a CVS update and specify the tag or the branch that you want. And because it's from version control, but because it's from CVS, you have access to do that. All Drush is doing is pulling this all this code from CVS. You can interact with it just like any other CVS system and pull whatever tag or branch you want to get. Okay, so installing updates. And this could be a pain in the butt if you're not using Drush. Um, I'm going to show you how to do it the standard way with CVS first, and then we'll look at Drush. So if you wanted to update CCK, you basically change directory into CCK and then you would call an update command saying CVS up, which is uh, you know short for update. You'd pass it a couple parameters to, to pull new directories and prune empty ones, and then you would give it the revision number of CCK to pull. So again, how do you know what revision number to pull? You'd have to go through that whole process I showed you earlier. Or you could use Drush. Um, call Drush update, and Drush will do it for you. It'll look for the version control, or the version, the tag number, to pull. But Drush Update actually does, uh, takes it one step further. You see, to install updates for each module, the CVS way, you would have to change directory into each module uh, one by one. You'd change directory into CCK, update that module. Change directory into Views, update that module. Change directory into Admin Menu, update that module. What's nice about Drush Update is you can type that command anywhere in your Drupal install, and it'll grab the latest update status information, and then it'll give you a list of all the modules that need to be updated. CCK is running 2.4, it should be 2.5. I mean, that's, that's great. You don't, you don't have to go to the website, see what the latest version is. Uh, you know, Drush is doing that all for you. One thing to uh, make note of, if you're going to be pulling code from CVS and um, you know, not downloading the package file, Update status isn't going to know how to look to see what version of the module you're running. You need to download this CVS deploy module, and what that'll do is that'll let update status know, hey, look at the tag name for CVS and not the actual uh, version name in the info file. So if you are going to use this technique, uh, make sure you write that down. You need to download CVS deploy to see um, what updates you have. So yeah, drush update, simple command, it grabs the latest uh, update status information, and it shows you what needs to be updated. So at the bottom of that page, you can see that, uh, you know, here's the end of the list, and it's basically going to say these are the packages that are going to be updated, and then before it actually does the update, it warns you, or it asks you a question. Do you really want to continue? Yes, we do. So right here, you can see that, okay, so it's, it downloaded CCK, it was updated successfully, C tools successfully, file field successfully, image field successfully, uh, module Zen, now um, Zen is not a module, it's a, it's a theme. Well, you know, Drush isn't perfect yet, Drush doesn't deal with themes yet, it's, uh, as far as updating the modules, you can download uh, themes with Drush, but you can't update them uh, from there, so you're, gonna, you're going to have to do that uh, manually, go ahead. Yeah, there is. And that leads me to my next slide. No, 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 that's a great question. Um, so if you don't want to update, the question was, is, is there a way to update uh, specific modules and not have to update all the modules in your site? Um, what's nice about Drush as well is there's really good documentation for each of the commands that you can use. So you can see here that I typed in Drush help update. Gives me a little description of what it does, and I see arguments that I can pass in here. I can pass in modules, and there's space. It's a space delimited list of modules. So if I only wanted to update views in CCK, I would just type Drush update views CCK, and that would just update those packages. 
All right, so let's, uh, since Stretch won't update the theme, let's go ahead and update the theme with a CVS command. And this is what uh, that looks like. We changed directory into the Zen, Zen folder. We're running our command, CVS up, the version number, and it goes along and updates the theme. Now, when you're working with version control, uh, you'll see, uh, you know, the files that it's working with and these different uh, characters next to it, like a question mark, a P, a U. Basically, what this is saying is from the, uh, we've patched this file, you know, so from the previous version, you know, this file has changed and we patched that and these files were updated. So we're basically grabbing the latest updates, the latest, I mean, all of these are pretty much patches, uh, but we're grabbing the latest from the server. Now, you can see here, these are U's and, um, you know, like I said, version control systems work with patches because they're a lot smaller, but if the file is actually smaller than the patch, it'll just download the whole file. And that's what you see here. It's uh, actually updating the whole entire file. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. All right, so with that said, uh, let's see how you can create patches. Uh, and now this is, you know, when you're, when you're working with Drupal, um, patches are basically how you uh, pass around the different functionality that you're that you're creating in Drupal. So if if you're you know working on Drupal core, we don't have access to commit um, updates to Drupal core. So the way that we can contribute back to Drupal core is we create patches, and basically these are pat these patches are applied by the core contributors, and then they commit those to Drupal core for us. So there's a couple ways to actually do this. Um, there's a command called CVS diff. And then there's a Unix utility called diff. And these come on, uh, you know, on your Mac computers if you're running Xcode tools and then any Linux computers. Uh, for Windows, you'd have to download uh, SigWin and download uh, the diff module and the CVS module to be able to uh, do this. I've got a couple best practices here. Uh, if you're gonna create patches against uh, Drupal core, make sure that you're in the document root of Drupal. When these patches are created, they are context sensitive to where you create the patch. So when the patch is applied, whoever's applying that patch needs to be in that same directory. So whenever you're creating a patch and submitting it to the issue queue for core, uh, make sure you're in the document root so it's easy to apply. <clears throat> for contrib, same thing. You're not gonna be in the document root of the actual Drupal installation, but you're gonna be in the root directory of the actual module. Uh, so the best practices. To actually create a patch, uh, you would just type in CVS diff. Uh, you pass in a couple parameters for a recursive and then you want a unified diff. And basically what this, is, this would do is if we were in the CCK directory and we typed that, uh, it would take the differences that we have on our local machine, compare them against what's up in the CVS repository and create a patch file for us. And uh, you know, that's how we would pass these changes around in the issue queue. And then if you weren't using CVS, you know, you could use the, the diff utility. Um, so the same type of thing, original directory, new directory, and you output that to a patch file. And if you want more information on how to actually create a patch, uh, you can go to drupal.org and get that information. So let's, let's look at a patch file. So this is a, this is a simple patch file. Um, this is the options widget inside of CCK and uh, I pulled the differences between CCK 2.4 and CCK 2.5 just for this module and created a patch so I can show you guys what a patch file looks like. So when you're creating a patch file, like I said, it's just, a patch file is just the differences. So you can see here that we've got two different files. One was last modified on March 18th. The other one was last modified on August 3rd. Uh, we've got a plus next to the new one and a minus next to the old one. We can see in here uh, what was different from the previous version. So from 2.4 to 2.5 of CCK in the options widget, this line was taken out and this line was put in. So that'll get, kind of give you an idea of how version control works. We're just working with the differences. Now, if you were to apply this patch to your system, you wouldn't have to actually do this manually and find the line of code and pull it out and put the new line of code in. There's, uh, there's actually a patch utility uh, that comes with most Linux systems and your, your Mac OS X if you're running Xcode tools. And I believe Patch comes with SigWin as well. Um, not very familiar with Windows, but I, I think that's there. Uh, the way you would apply that patch is you just use the patch utility. 
uh, you're going to say, you know, relative to this local directory. Um, we won't really get into that, but uh, you would just pass in the patch file. So basically, the patch file is going to patch this local directory uh, and take out whatever needs to be taken out and put in whatever needs to be put in for you. You don't have to do that manually. Any questions regarding that? What process? Okay, great. Yeah, uh, the question was, are these slides on the website? I'll, I'll post these up on the website. Uh, if you go to activelamp.com, uh, give me about 10 minutes after the presentation, and I'll upload those. These to activelamp.com, we'll have them right there on the front page. So you guys can uh, pull this down and reference these URLs here for more information. All right, so we're using uh, CVS now to manage our Drupal install from version control. But what do you do with all your local changes? You know, we're not just creating Drupal sites that don't have other modules and other customizations and other theme things that uh, we're doing. So how do we manage that? And for Active Lamp, that's where subversion uh, comes into play. And it doesn't have to be subversion. It could be any other version control system, but not CVS because you don't want, uh, you can't use two different CVS systems on the same set of files. You know, you're gonna have conflicts there. So uh, we use Subversion uh, for our development on customizations, but you can use Git, you can use Bazaar, you can use Mercurial if you guys wanna use that. We actually use a hosted service uh, for our Subversion called Unfuddle. Uh, if you haven't heard of Unfuddle, it's a, actually a really great service. Um, it gives you subversion hosting and also Git hosting, but it also gives you project, uh, project management console so you can manage a project all right there from Unfuddle. And I'm just gonna show you uh, one of the screens uh, from uh, one of the projects that we're working on in Unfuddle. What's nice about Unfuddle is you can go to the repositories tab here and we can see a history, uh, a very clean history, not having to be in the command line of what's going on um, with this project. So you can see here, we've got several commits going on. You know, on Friday, Hellier made a commit. He's working on some theme stuff. You know, down here, uh, you know, I made a commit uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Kevin's working on some feed API stuff. We've got different versions of uh, the code at any point in time, as long as we're making commits back to the repository. And this is where it's important to, you know, commit often and not commit in big chunks because we can easily, you know, if we break something, we can easily go back to a, a previous revision and see uh, what was different there. So as an example, uh, before, before I get into that, well, no, I'll go on. As an example, uh, I broke something here and you can see that I committed a bug here. Um, so we're gonna look at what, what, that, what that actually looks like, but before, but before we go in there, one other thing that uh, Unfuddle does is you can reference tickets in your commit messages. These are what are called uh, smart commit messages. Um, if you put in like refs number 38 or resolves number 38, what Unfuddle does is uh, that'll link it back up to the tickets inside of Unfuddle. We, we manage everything that we do uh, for our clients through a ticket system on Unfuddle. And whenever we make a change or, or something is um, associated with a specific ticket, we put in the actual number of the ticket. And at that point, we'd be able to click on this number, take us to a, the ticket system in Unfuddle, and see what we actually said we were gonna do in that ticket and be able to look at the code of that in there. Also on that, on that same ticket, we can see all the change sets, all the associated commits with that. So Unfuddle is just great when it comes to this because that's all built in for you. Um, I'm not, I don't know of uh, any other system that does that, but uh, yeah, that's, that's one great feature about Unfuddle. What's also nice about this is, you know, so here's something that I broke um, I don't know, last Friday around 10 o'clock, and I fixed a bug and, you know, I had a typo in there, I guess. So if we wanted to see what, actually, what I actually did to uh, fix that, we can click on 82 there. And Unfuddle does this for you. It'll say, okay, here's commit 82. You know, Tom Friedhoff did this. This is the message that he put in there. And these are the files that he updated in that uh, commit. And then it actually shows you all the files down here. Now, I just did one file, but if, we, if I did five different files, you'd see them all listed continuing to go down there. And then you can see in here real quickly, 
what I changed. Oh, you know what? Um, I was actually assigning volunteer map to every single view in this website rather than checking to see if the view I was looking at was volunteer map. So, um, yeah, that'll cause problems. So, I mean, this is really nice. You don't have to create patch files. It's, you know, it's all done for you right here in Unfuddle. So basically, our, um, our workflow with working with Drupal sites is we pull everything from CVS, uh, from Drupal. We install everything from CVS. Um, we don't actually use the CVS commands because that's what Drush is for. And you know, that, that'll find all the latest tags for us and, and download to our developer machines or local machines. From there, any custom changes that we uh, create, that all goes back into a subversion repository on Unfuddle. And from Unfuddle, you know, we have other developers that can grab those changes and we're able to, we're able to work with each other and not be clobbering each other's uh, changes because it looks at, looks at it line by line and we're, uh, yeah, basically able to work together without having to worry about those conflicts. Now every once in a while you will get conflicts um, because if you work on the same line of code, then, you know, your version control system is going to say, wait a second, two different people changed this line of code. And when you're updating your code, remember where we saw those question marks um, and the, you know, the U, t U letter for update, the P letter for patch, you know, you'll see a C there for conflict, which means I can't resolve this conflict. Two different people worked on the same line of code in that file. At that point, you're gonna have to manually go into that file, find uh, the conflict and resolve it for yourself. And then you would basically tell your subversion repository that, okay, this is resolved. You type in SVN resolve and the file name and basically the version control system would be happy saying, okay, it's resolved. And you'd be able to commit your changes again. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, what I covered today is we went over uh, revision control concepts. We looked at, uh, you know, decentralized version control and centralized version control, you know, the advantages of each, you know, SVN and, and centralized version control being a little bit simple, a little bit more simple, uh, decentralized, a little bit more complicated, but much more capability in there. Uh, we looked at installing Drupal and modules from CVS so we can easily manage updates, uh, manage uh, making changes um, through patches and submitting those back to the issue queue. Uh, we looked at the release system. Uh, that was, you know, the, the different branches and the different tags, you know, those are uh, specific points in time of the Drupal uh, development cycle. Uh, we talked about creating patches and applying patches using the different tools and then uh, managing your development environment uh, using two different version control systems and in our case uh, we use CVS and SVN. All right, so do we have any questions? Hey, good. If, if you find a, a bug like hidden in Drupal 4 somehow when you're doing, when you're downloading from cbs.drupal.org and you have to fix it for something that you're doing for a client, is there a way for you to come across from your SVN repository over and commit it as a patch to Drupal 4 somehow? Yeah, so uh, the question was if you find a bug in Drupal core, can you get that? over from your SVN repository to your to the CVS Drupal core repository. And actually, you know, if, as long as you're pulling everything from S, or CVS for Drupal, it really has nothing to do with your SVN repository because basically that file that you're working on is tracked in two different repositories now. It's tracked in your SVN repository and your CVS repository. So at that point, you would just make the change of the file, uh, fix the bug, and commit it to your SVN repository, and that would be it as far as the SVN repository. But to actually get that back into the Drupal core system, you, that's where you would create the patch. And you'd call the CVS diff dash UP, uh, I'll put that to a patch file, and then you'd go to the issue queue on drupal.org, say, hey, I found this patch, uh, this should be this, and you would upload that patch. They'd be able to look at that patch file, see the old lines that were in the file before, see the new lines that you added. You know, remember that patch file with the red and the green. And at that point, uh, apply the patch. And if you know if it does in fact fix the issue, you know, a WebChick or Dries would commit that back to Drupal Core. But that's basically how we can contribute back to Drupal Core. Is we create patches. We we don't have access to uh, to the CBS repository, or we don't have write access to that CBS repository for Drupal. So we basically create a patch. Uh, with those changes and submit it to the issue queue.
Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get like, yeah, there's a free account on Fuddle, and I think it's like 10 megabytes uh, that you get with that. I think it's one project, but it's unlimited uh, repositories on there as long as you don't exceed the 10 megabytes. So if you've never tried up Fuddle, go check it out. Um, yeah, it's free. The, their next uh, account up, I think, is $9, and that gives you, I don't know, 25 megabytes or a little bit more space. Um, good. I'm fairly new to version control. How would I actually go about setting us all on my mobile environment? Let's get my laptop. Easiest way. To yeah. Um, so there's a couple. Yeah, this, this presentation was more high level of what revision control is and what it can do for you. Uh, actually getting it working. You know, there's a couple resources online. If you Google SVN and then Red Bean, uh, there's, a, there's a Red Bean book that will show you, to give you, you know, it's basically a free book online that you can read and, and get all the information about that. Uh, and there's also a CVS book done by Red Bean. So if you Google CVS and Red Bean. Um, but yeah, basically you'd, you'd be using those tools like the SBN admin create. Yeah, I didn't, didn't get into that just because of the, the shortage of time. Um, but yeah, go online and look for that book. Would you suggest any other Yeah, so you wouldn't really want an SVN repository local unless you're the only person that's going to be working on it. Um, you'd you'd kind of want that on the internet and maybe through a hosted service like on a funnel. You know, if you want a local repository, I would go with something more like Git uh, and get that installed locally. And, and Git runs locally. You don't have to have a tracking repository like I showed you uh, in the diagram. But when you are ready to have a tracking repository, at that point, you could just say Git clone clone this repository, put it on whatever central server you want it, and you know, just modify a couple configurations in there saying that, okay, this central server is my tracking repository. And uh, basically, after you do that, on your local host, all you'd have to do is call git pull or git push, and it would know which repository to actually go to and pull the different changes out there. So if you want a local revision control system without you know, something central, git would probably be the, the choice to go with. Yeah, Bazaar is another uh, distributed version control system, and uh, there's one called Mercurial. Actually, there's a there's a website called Peep Code. Um, I think it's peepcode.com, right? Yeah, peepcode.com, and basically that's a website of tutorials for different Ruby uh, things. But it's not just Ruby. You know, they also have tutorials on uh, Git. They have tutorials on I think Mercurial and Bazaar. Uh, but you know they're like nine dollars a piece. They're they're really good tutorials if you want to get a uh, understanding of how these systems work. But yeah, there's a, there's a Git um, tutorial on peepcode.com if you want to get more information about that. So mostly it seems like you were uh, talking about command line interfaces to version control. What do you think of the various GUI ones? You know I haven't used uh, the GUI ones, and I, I don't know of any on the Mac. Cornerstone. Cornerstone on the Mac? Yeah. Um, for me, it's, you know, it's much quicker just to go into the command line and just type in these commands. But uh, yeah, I don't have any experience with the, the GUI ones. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, if you had, uh, say, a repository in SVN and uh, three different branches of development in a sandbox branch and then one that had its own file system but connected to the live, um, site, and then the live site, say you wanted to move some changes from the development branch to the, the staging branch. Uh, from what I understand, like SVN loses its history when you kind of copy it over. Uh, do you know how to do that without yeah. losing history? Uh, I'm not sure about it losing history. Uh, we've done that before. There's a command called the SVN merge. Which basically, you know, you give it the the revision number for the branch that you want to merge into the branch that you're currently in on. So if you're on the you know the trunk branch, which is you know head uh, from that diagram that I showed you guys, you would basically do an SBN merge, grab everything from the branch that you want to merge it uh, merge into this trunk, and call, basically call it SBN merge. As far as the losing the version history, I, I'm not sure about that. I I wouldn't think that it would lose that history. 
Any other questions? Cool. All right. Well, thank you.